Welcome to the Ethical Schools Podcast. I'm Amy Helper Laugh. And I'm John Moscow. For this special video episode, we've collaborated with Dr. Mira Levinson of the Ed Ethics Initiative at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. This is the third in a series of episodes featuring normative case studies that explore ethical dilemmas in schools. As Dr. Levinson describes in her book, Dilemmas of Educational Ethics, normative case studies are richly described realistic accounts of complex ethical dilemmas that arise within practice or policy contexts. Each of these case studies focuses on a particular decision point in which the right course of action is unclear. The cases help diverse groups of people discuss challenging ethical questions in nuanced and inclusive ways. Today, we're exploring the case study, Walling Out or Welcoming In, written by Sarah Kaleha, Tony Kokenes, and Mira Levinson. The case is set at a K-8 school where parents, teachers, and administrators on the school culture committee are meeting to address a recent surge in divisive language among students. The first part of this video presents the case narrative performed by a talented group of actors. Immediately following the case narrative, Dr. Levinson will discuss the case with a diverse group of thinkers. In this discussion, they explored the ethical dilemmas in the case, along with the competing values and policy considerations that make the right course of action so difficult to determine. We hope the case and the conversation highlight many important and challenging questions related to parental rights, teacher autonomy, and community involvement in education. And now, here's the case video. Though it was a late weeknight, the monthly meeting of the School Culture Committee, the SCC, at the Jersey City K-8 school was pulsing with energy. In light of a recent surge of divisive language among students, the team of teachers, parents, and the principal was eager to finish drafting the SCC's proposed guidelines for strengthening and evaluating school culture. Jersey City's principal, Ms. Winters, opened the meeting by checking in on an incident that had arisen a few weeks before. Okay, let's check in with our social emotional learning coordinator. How has it been going with Danielle and her friends? Are they still ostracizing Danielle because of her family support of Trump? Are there Tuesday lunches with you helping, Rob? Uh, I've been inspired by the willingness to be honest with each other, but it is going to take a lot more time and work for their friendship to be repaired. Danielle's friends, especially, but not only her friends of color, just aren't able to reconcile the fact that she says positive things about Trump. Teresa, in particular, still can't forgive Danielle for making that comment about criminal legals, given what she knows about Teresa's cousin. And Danielle is just so hurt that her friends are holding her political views against her. They're all taking these statements very personally. Well, it's hard not to take it personally. White students are the minority at this school, but they're treated like they're the unjustly privileged majority. Hey, Kyle Collin told me at dinner last night that there are other kids in the seventh grade who won't work with him just because they know our family voted for Trump. He wants to switch schools, but we can't afford to move to a whiter district or send him to a private school. Well, I love having Colin in my humanities class. I hope he won't switch schools. I think the problem is that many of Trump's statements are emotionally damaging to many of our students. They lack the coping strategies. Right. How are they supposed to react when they hear their classmates insinuating that they don't even belong in this country? I believe in zero tolerance for bullying. That's the point of this committee, to make sure that JCK through 8 has a culture we can be proud of, where no child is bullied or harassed. But in these instances, I feel like our kids, even my first grader, are having to set boundaries because the school isn't doing it for them. I agree. Our committee needs to set some boundaries more clearly. But I worry about characterizing these disputes automatically as bullying or harassment. You know that by state law, we are mandated reporters for all incidents of bullying or harassment. I don't think we should be reporting and punishing Danielle or Teresa or our Collins classmates. We should be teaching them how to work together and get along. But we have anti-bullying laws for a reason. And we can't overlook the harm that treating bullying or harassment as teachable moments could have on kids being bullied, especially those from marginalized groups. That would do everything but create a safe space for students to learn. You faced a version of this teachable moment question in your class last week, uh, didn't you, Elena? 
We were in the block room and a small group of boys began building a wall that spanned the width of the classroom. At first, I thought nothing of it. But then they started chanting, build the wall, build the wall. No, they did not. How am I going to discuss this with Marquis tonight and just before bedtime? I could see that some of my students were feeling uncomfortable and I immediately called a time out. Normally, I don't interfere with the children's play. They need the freedom to explore, problem solve, and negotiate differences on their own. But this time something felt different. I couldn't just sit back and watch. I asked them, what are you boys working on, hmm? Eddie responded. We're building the wall to keep the Mexicans out. They were so excited and proud of their work. I've seen similar incidences in my class. What did you do? I was so angry, I had to pause for a few seconds and just breathe deeply. Then I thought maybe I'd just redirect them to a different activity. Say, bring out the paints instead. Because, after all, they don't know the hate behind what they're saying. But then I felt like, you know what? They're in my class now. I'm their teacher. It is my responsibility to educate them and help them understand that we should embrace others rather than fear them. So. In front of the whole class, I posed the question, why do some people want to keep other people out? And the kids had so many interesting comments. Sometimes you just wanna be alone or with your best friends. And so you have to say no to some people. You might keep people out because you have to stay safe and you don't know if strangers could be dangerous. Because the Mexicans will take our jobs. I turned to Eddie and I asked him, what is your job? He looked at me with wide eyes and shrugged his shoulders. I quietly said to my class, your job, boys and girls, is to come to school to learn. And while you are at school, your job is to be kind, to be caring, and to be respectful so that everyone has a safe learning space. Do you think anyone can stop you from being kind, caring, and respectful? And they all said, no. So I said, then nobody can take your job. Thank you, Ms. Morales. You are teaching our children what really counts in life, to be kind to each other and to think about their actions. You didn't shame the boys or talk about politics. You just guided them toward their better selves. I know I speak for the families of all of the marginalized children in your classroom when I say thank you. Don't any of you see what's going on here? Those boys were play acting the policies of the former president of the United States and their public school teacher, a state employee no less, leveraged her personal, moral, and political reasoning to stop them. That was a partisan move. Through and through, the boys were creatively engineering a wall and, and they were drawing on their knowledge of current events in the process. That should have been celebrated by the teacher, but instead their entire innovation was discouraged. If you want to make it a teachable moment, Miss Morales, you could have taken the time to explain to them the difference between legal and illegal immigration. That would have been a good lesson. Gregory has a point, everyone. We can't censor student play or creativity just because it happens to disagree with our politics. As I've said before, school needs to be a neutral space, a politics-free zone. With all due respect, how can school be a politics-free zone? What happened in Elena's classroom and with Colin, Danielle, and Teresa shows us that politics will enter the school whether we plan for it or not. That's why we set up this committee, right? I totally agree. The purpose of school is to prepare students to be citizens in a democracy. How can we prepare future citizens if we can't talk about politics? We need to lean into these conversations, not back away. If we're going to lean into politics, let's have our kids study the First Amendment. You can't censor something just because it doesn't agree with you. That's a freedom we fight for all around the world. But these kids are in school. Adults can walk away from offensive statements or people, but our children can't go anywhere. Madison is right. Students don't have total freedom of speech. We have to be mindful of our state and federal bullying laws. We can't ignore statements and incidents that create a hostile learning environment and inhibit students' learning, especially since attendance is mandatory. She's exactly right. Free speech doesn't mean that schools shouldn't teach children how to be kind to one another. 
maybe it's my liberal bias, but I'm not going to stop teaching inclusion and social emotional skills just because our national political discourse has lowered the bar below civility. I'm all for teaching kindness. Just don't confuse kindness with political ideology. Democrats don't have a monopoly on good character. Hey, not to mention your inclusiveness seems to stop where conservative perspectives begin. Those shepherd fairy posters showing everyone except the white male as part of we the people. Yeah, let me tell you, Colin notices that his views and people that hold them aren't welcome. I hardly think that posters featuring women of color saying things like we the people protect each other and we the people defend dignity are inappropriate. They're simply inclusive. The posters are meant to show all students that we value them as people and that we'll work together to create an inclusive classroom in which everyone's needs and rights are respected. Would you be equally happy to put up a poster of a white man standing up for our Second Amendment gun rights? All right. These are great conversations, but not ones we can resolve in the uh, few minutes we have left tonight. I'm wondering where we can stand more generally. Do we have any principles or policies we can agree will improve school culture while respecting student diversity, including political diversity?